Thanks for having me. It's super interesting just to see the different talks and, and uh, you know, obviously the, the photos are incredible, but just all the work that people are doing. And uh, my name is Irving Fain. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bowery Farming. And some of you guys may know Bowery, uh, but myself, I got uh, started as an entrepreneur as a very young kid. So I've been an entrepreneur since as, as long as I can remember. And my, my dad was an entrepreneur and his father was an entrepreneur. And I've just sort of grown up in it and within it. And you can see here, this is myself, my younger brother, and his friend after, as you can see by the splayed out cash, a very successful day of selling roses and lemonade and t-shirts at a local college graduation. Luckily, I sort of graduated from that. And uh, after a short stint as a banker here in New York, I moved into the last 15 plus years in high growth technology. So, built iHeartRadio as a part of Clear Channel, and from there went on to found my first company, which is an enterprise software company, again based here in New York, called CrowdTwist. And we raised a bunch of venture capital, grew the business, and got to a point where I was really interested in working on something that not only was I very personally passionate about, but I felt could have an impact beyond just myself, which I think is, is sort of a, a theme that you're hearing tonight. And that's what led me to Bowery. So what is Bowery? Bowery is the modern farming company, and we are growing food for a better future by revolutionizing agriculture. So what does that mean? We build very large warehouse scale indoor farms. And in those farms, we have a completely controlled, contained environment, and we stack LEDs vertically so that we can grow much more efficiently using the cubic space of any indoor environment we're in versus a traditional horizontal farm. And, and because of the way we set up our farms, we can actually grow 365 days of the year, totally independent of weather and seasonality. So right there, the undisrupted, reliable production of high quality food is a total departure from the way that agriculture has functioned essentially for thousands of years. But beyond that, we grow with absolutely no pesticides and no agrochemicals at all. And if you're gonna grow like that in the field, what you very quickly see is you're gonna see declining in your quality, but you're also gonna see your yields plummet. In our case, because of the control that we have, we first and foremost, are able to grow more than twice as fast as the field. We grow more crop cycles every year than the field grows, and we get more yield out of every single crop cycle. So we actually end up over 100 times plus more productive than a single square footage of farmland, and we save 95% of the water when we grow. So it's a really compelling and different way to, to think about agriculture from the ground up. And I think that's really what I wanted to talk a little bit about today, a little bit about Bowery, but also just about how do you think about building a company in a more mature industry? How do you think about building a company in an industry where technology maybe hasn't come in and rethought and, and transformed the existing methods from the bottom up? In an industry where maybe there isn't as much venture capital being put forth, in an industry where the business operations may cost more and require more capital than some of the traditional businesses in the last decade or so, which are much more software-based and asset light. When I started to think about Bowery, and I started to think even before about Bowery, what I wanted to do next, I started with the premise for me, like I'm a believer and always have been that the innovation economy and technology can solve not only big problems, but important problems. And as you look around, as I spent a lot more time in agriculture, what, what you very quickly see is that agriculture, whether it be directly or indirectly, is at the epicenter of an enormous number of global problems. We use 70% of the world's water supply every year just for our agricultural practices. And just in the US alone, we put down over 700 million pounds of pesticides every single year. So you imagine those pesticides are in the soil and they're eroding the quality of our topsoil. They are getting into the water supply, so streams and lakes and rivers, but reservoirs and oceans. And they're on the actual food that we're eating and that's going to our body and our children's body. So you have a system that is consuming more and more resources, doing damage to the land around us. Just in the last 40 years, we've actually lost 30% of the arable land globally. So the system we have isn't going to scale forward. 
And what you see is while there's technological solutions being applied to agriculture, you see things like drones and satellite imagery, driverless tractors, precision agriculture. These are very important solutions and steps forward. There hasn't been a solution necessarily to look at the problem from an entirely and completely different angle. How do we grow entirely differently? And that becomes even more important when you think that according to the UN, we're going to have 9 to 10, to 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. And to feed that growing population, we need somewhere between 50 to 70 percent more food. So a very real problem. What drove me originally to be thinking about Bowery specifically is all that change is happening and 70 to 80 percent of the population is going to be living in and around cities. We are living in an increasingly urbanized world. So how do you provide fresh food to urban environments and how do you do that more sustainably and more efficiently? And that was a question I became very interested in and, and essentially very obsessed with. So I am a believer that scale and impact are closely correlated to one another. So people today are talking about big problems. If you want to solve a big global issue, you want to think about a solution that can scale, not just a solution that's relevant in a single city, but a, a solution that can scale up and be relevant in cities around the country and around the world. And one of the great drivers of scalability can be technology. And so we thought a lot about how do you apply technology to provide scale around this problem. But secondarily, when you are able to, to couple not only technology, but also economics to drive scale, it's even more powerful. Because if you can put a business model that actually is driving profits for the entities that are leveraging technology and actually doing good, that puts you in a position to really amplify your efforts and solve your problems at the largest scale. I spent a lot of time just looking around at what was happening in urban agriculture and all the different methods and technologies and approaches to solving the problem. And what really became the catalyst for what we're doing at Bowery was technology in the LED space. So you may know this, but the government and NASA and universities in their labs have been growing food and other things under lights indoors for decades, actually. The problem was the lights themselves are far too expensive or were far too expensive and their efficiency was very poor. So you could grow food, but the food that you were growing was never going to be viable from a commercial perspective. It was just too expensive. About seven years ago, everything changed and the cost of LEDs dropped off a cliff. It declined by over 85%. And at the same time, we saw the efficiency of LED fixtures more than double. And what that meant was what was only possible in labs now could actually be done in a commercially viable way. So that was an opportunity to look and say, wow, this is an incredible innovation and trend that's happening in LEDs, and couple that with the innovation and advancement that was happening in robotics and automation, innovation and advancement that was happening in machine learning, and the general decline in both the cost of storage but also processing of data. And there was an opportunity to take all of those trends together and essentially rethink what agriculture looks like in the 21st century. So how do you even start that? Well, the first thing if you're building a business, particularly in one of these frontier tech industries that can be bigger and complex and may not be as touched with technology is figuring out the why now. Like, Why is now the time to do what you're doing? And this is sort of a tried and true principle in the world of VC. In our case, the LEDs were a very, very compelling why now makes sense. But then you need to really start with a thesis. And in our case, we really thought about the business and kind of three key components. The first being the grow system, and that's what allows us through automation and robotics and a proprietary system that we've built to grow with enormous productivity gains. The next part, though, was the software layer, what we call the Bowery operating system, and it's a proprietary system developed by us for us, and it takes in millions of points of data in real time. So data that has an impact on how the plants are growing, their quality, their texture, their ultimate yield, even things like taste and flavor. We have a plant vision system, which is actually looking at those plants and then running those images through our own proprietary machine learning algorithms and saying, what am I seeing? What's happening with this plant? And what do I expect to see in the future? And then all of that data gets run through other machine learning algorithms. And we look and say, do we like what we're seeing? Are the changes that are happening positive or negative? What do we want to adjust? And how do we want to adjust it? And then those changes get pushed out 
back into our growth system all in an automated and iterative way so you can not only drive yield gains, quality gains, but you can even do things like tweak the taste and flavor. The third piece of this was building a brand that consumers could trust, a brand that was really anchored in honesty, that was anchored in transparency, that was anchored in responsibility and sustainability and health and wellness. And we're well positioned to do that because we grow our food right in the same areas where consumers are actually consuming that food. So in the same cities where that product's actually being sold. The, the thing about building what we are building in, in, at Bowery in agriculture, but in any of these frontier tech industries, is oftentimes they're very complicated. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving parts, a lot of different disciplines at work. And in my case and in anyone's case as a founder, one of your jobs is to essentially be honest with yourself and say, first of all, what are the key questions that I need to answer to determine whether or not this business will work? And we looked at this and, and very kind of carefully said, how do we know that this is going to scale? And not just scale, but how do we make sure that we can grow the highest quality product at the cheapest possible prices? Because we wanted to make sure that we were growing better food accessible to more people. And we needed to answer that question before we raised a single dollar. But then it was about what expertise do we need to do that? And listen, I'm not an agricultural scientist. I'm not a mechanical engineer. And for that matter, I'm not a software engineer. So I wasn't going to be the person that was going to derive all the, the hypotheses and understand the answers here. And so went out and really through talking and learning and understanding, built an incredible team of experts in each of the areas that mattered. And we began testing, and we began understanding different grow technologies, different grow systems. We wanted to understand hydroponics versus aeroponics in different ways, in greenhouses, and really approach the problem essentially from a first principle basis, from the standpoint of we believe this is a problem that needs to be solved. What's the best technology to do that? And as an entrepreneur, your job in this mission is, of course, you're going to be an optimist, and you always believe in yourself. That's critical. But you need to also understand the bear case, not just the bull case. So I went out. There's a, someone named Dixon De Palmier in New York. He literally wrote the book called The Vertical Farm. Uh, so he was in, at Columbia. I emailed him, asked if he'd have lunch. He said, absolutely. Jumped on a subway, headed up to him. I show up at his office. His secretary looks at me wide-eyed. When I asked for him, said, he's not actually here asked where he normally goes. She said, an Irish pub around the corner. So I grabbed my bag and sort of tromp over there. There he is sitting behind the table eating buffalo wings. So I asked if I can sit down. Luckily, I love buffalo wings. So I sat down with Dixon and, and ended up having an hour and a half conversation with him about the virtues and all the potential of indoor farming. Now, he believed that indoor farming was going to take over every bit of agriculture in the entire world. I'm not sure that I agree with that. But you, of course, leave a conversation like that energized and excited. But on the other side of it, we went and sought out someone named Lou Albright, who works up at Cornell and really believes firmly that indoor agriculture isn't the way to solve this problem. And we had a number of different phone calls with Lou and his team to understand why did they believe what they believed, how were they thinking about the problem, how did they arrive at their conclusions, because we felt it was our imperative to prove that wrong if we were going to move this thing forward. And ultimately, through a lot of work and a lot of effort on our end, we got to a point where we felt some of the assumptions that they were making were not right, and that there were things that we could do that they weren't thinking about. And that was really when we said, hey, it, it's time for us to press ahead. And for us, pressing ahead meant raising money. And it doesn't mean that for everybody. And I think the, the big thing here, particularly in the world of frontier technology, where oftentimes things could be more expensive, is always remembering that fundraising is an exercise in milestone management. And what that means is you're raising X dollars at Y valuation from an investor. And when you raise those X dollars, you're raising them with the expectation that over some period of time, you're going to prove a set of assumptions and accomplish a certain number of milestones, which will allow you to raise your next round of funding at a substantially larger number than Y dollars. And right now, we're living in a world where there's a real fascination with high valuations, enormous funding rounds. And there's a danger in that. Because if you take too much money too early or you raise it too high of a price too early, you can get yourself into a situation where you set such a high bar from where you are today and where you need to go that you can't actually accomplish what you need to. And so it's a lesson for every entrepreneur in any business, but certainly in the world of frontier technology, this really rings true. The good news is, 
as an entrepreneur, I don't think that there's a better time to be starting a company and interesting in new parts of this of the ecosystem. There's more dollars available and more interest from the venture community to be funding and getting involved with industries that you wouldn't have imagined to be funded by venture capitalists even a few years ago. There are entrepreneurs out there coming out of industries that weren't breeding entrepreneurs, coming in with experiences and skill sets, joining early stage companies. So whether you want to start something or whether you are wanting to join in someone else's company, it is really an incredible time to be a part of the innovation economy in some of these more frontier industries. And so as an entrepreneur, but also just a citizen in the world, that gives me a lot of optimism. So thank you guys very much. Happy to answer any questions. Very cool. Thank you so much. Uh, tell us a little bit about the farm. I mean, whatever you can uh, share about what uh, you guys do, how it works. Uh. Yeah, I mean, it is, so the entire farm is essentially software controlled, so everything that happens in the farm is essentially running through the Bowery operating system in one manner or another. So it's actually not only what's happening from an agricultural science perspective, but it's also what's happening from a work management perspective and thinking about all the way from when seeds are planted to when that product actually has to land in stores. And when you think about scalability, that actually becomes a really important part of scaling the, the, the system itself and scaling Bowery because if we want to build farms across the country and across the world, you can't rely on a certain number of different experts to be in every single city. You can't rely on necessarily farming experts. You can't necessarily rely on operational experts in every single place. And so by putting a lot of the expertise and the knowledge into the software, you put yourself in a position where a lot of our farmers have never grown a plant in their entire life, and they don't need to. So we can come into cities and we can offer jobs to people in farming, but almost in new manufacturing that don't require a, a serious specialization, which is, I think for us gives us a lot of excitement. Very cool. And the product is out, right? It's been, yeah, it's product. You can find it in New York. We're in select Whole Foods. We're in uh, Foragers, which is actually right by here. And Chef Tom Calicchio, who some of you guys know, is actually an advisor, an investor, and uh, has our product on the menu at both Kraft and Temple Court. So it's always fun to see uh, what incredible chefs do with what we grow. Yeah, very cool. Let me open up to some questions from here. Let me grab this. Um, what's your business model and how are you going to feed the world? Because it seems like if you're going to do it one farm at a time, it will take time. So are you going to do franchise, sell technology? Totally. Uh, well, first of all, I, I think sometimes people like to play the zero-sum game game, which is, you know, we, we are, I don't expect we are the singular solution for world hunger or, you know, the ills of agriculture. I think that, you know, I was talking about precision ag and, and some of the things that are happening with drones and satellite imagery. Everything that's happening has to come together and work together to solve a bigger problem. But indoor farming is going to be an incredibly important part of what the agricultural system looks like moving forward. And so from a model perspective, we not only design our farms, we build our farms, we operate our farms, we grow the produce, and we sell the produce as well. So we are a completely vertically integrated business all the way from conceptualizing and iterating the software and the hardware all the way down to making sure the highest quality product is getting into stores. And that means that we control the process from seed to store. So we control the quality. We know what we need to innovate and why continuously. And what we're doing is building farms ultimately around the US and around the world because the problem that we're focused on is one that cities share everywhere globally. I mean, we hear from cities every single, and governments all the time in this country, but in, com in countries uh, elsewhere, who are just saying, hey, listen, we, we need solutions like this. Either we don't have food security, or there's not trust in our food system in our country. I mean, there's examples all over the world. So we're building our second farm now. I'm trying to take uh, Joey quality photography. <laughs> My iPhone, let me tell you, it's not working. Uh, you hear me? Hi. I was wondering about your approach for an alternative to pesticides, as well as whether you're growing the produce in soil or water, yeah. and also if it is in soil, whether you've considered uh, the downsides of sometimes some produce which contains no bacteria at all, which is important to building immunity, and it's relatively harmless bacteria. Yep. 
So there are a bunch of questions in there. Uh, so we, I'm going to answer try in one big whirl. So we grow in a totally contained environment, and actually food safety for us is of incredible importance because, again, if you're going to talk to people about trust and honesty and, and believing in the product, then we need to hold ourselves to the highest standard and make sure the product that we're growing, like we stand behind it. So we hold ourselves to a very high food safety standard beyond sort of what the industry needs. And the, the design of the farm and the way our systems are designed is done to eliminate a lot of sort of in and out traffic. So therefore, we don't have the same kind of pest issues that you see in other types of places and other types of systems. We do not grow in soil. So we grow in a soilless way and we grow hydroponically. But one of the things that the Bowery operating system lets us do and one of the things that our system lets us do is make sure that the nutrients and what the plant's getting is exactly what it needs to thrive in the perfect environment. And the difference between what we do and what happens out in the world is you can't control the environment. You can't control what happens around you. And in some ways, the reason genetic modification has come about is because when you can't control the world around you, you control the genetics of the plants themselves, because that's the one variable you can control. In our case, we can control all of the environmental parameters and all of the different attributes that actually affect the way the plant's going and the things that it may need resistance to out in the world. And so by having that control, you can do things like draw flavor out of a plant, have plants grow differently, you can change spectrum in light and even see changes in color. It's, it's pretty incredible what you can actually do just by tweaking variables. Assuming you were powering this uh, farm with solar panels that then feed to LED lights, how is your energy efficiency comparing to an outdoor farm and when do we get to like a, we obviously are there yet, I assume, to essentially an energy balance? It's a great question. Uh, so. It, the, when you look at traditional farms, what you actually see is that not only is there a lot of energy consumed on the farms and in the farming itself, but there's actually a lot of energy consumed in the processing of that product. And then there's a lot of energy consumed in the transportation of that product. And so we're eliminating most of all the processing energy. We're eliminating all of the transportation energy. And we certainly consume more energy from an LED perspective on the farm. You know, we're already looking at sustainable energy sources as we're building out our farms. And I think one of the things for us that gives us a lot of optimism is when you look at that curve I put up earlier on LEDs, there's actually going to be continuing efficiency gains in the LED market. And so as those efficiency gains continue to come into play, less and less power is going to be required to run our farms. And as, as renewable and sustainable energy becomes cheaper and more available, we see a very clear future where not only do we need less energy, but more and more of our energy can actually be provided by renewable sources. Um, given that you came into Bowery without kind of all this domain expertise, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you went about hiring the team and yeah. specifically how you even evaluated whether they'd be good for it? <laughs> it's, it's a great question. Uh, so first of all, I, I taught myself a lot, uh, as best I could. You can never be an expert, right? But I, I spent dozens and dozens and dozens of hours, I mean, probably hundreds of hours, really, reading everything I can get in my hands on, watching anything I get my hands on, and then talking to everybody I get my hands on. So it didn't have to be people who were relevant, talking to people in the outside agriculture world, talking to people in the, in the academic world. Just, I wanted to understand the industry as best as I could. And this was before I even felt that this was the best direction, because there was a lot you could do in farming. And as I started to, started to hone in on what I believe was the biggest opportunity, which was around this indoor farming opportunity, then it was about forming that thesis and saying, okay, how is, are we gonna best tackle this and what skill sets do we need? And honestly, I, I, one of the things I've learned from this, I think you know intuitively, but the power of network, like your, your network has so much leverage and value sometimes that you don't even appreciate and it's moments like these where it starts to bear fruit. So, you know, one of my co-founders, Brian, is sitting here. Uh, Brian lived in Michigan, actually moved here to New York to, to be a part of Bowery and, and I met Brian because I'd sat down with somebody I knew in New York Tech who'd introduced me to somebody else that he had known and she and I were having coffee and she had just met this guy named Brian at a conference 
conference somewhere else and said, you should at least talk to him. And Brian was a mechanical and systems engineer who was interested in and working on indoor farming. And we got on the phone or on a Google Hangout and after talking for a while, sort of saw that we saw eye to eye, wanted to do the same things. And I think a lot of it for me was also relying on people around me who I did trust, who had certain expertise to help vet and evaluate certain individuals. I think the other thing you realize is and this is true for any entrepreneur, you're not gonna build your final company with the first four people that you hire, right? So we didn't need to find the perfect people for every single role because we don't even know what the perfect people for a role is. What we needed is great, smart, driven, highly collaborative sets of people who had the right knowledge in the right place and we needed to come together and we needed to work together. That's exactly what we did and as we've done that, now we look and say, hey, Brian's great at this. We also need someone who knows electrical engineering. We also need someone who knows this. But we never would have gotten there if we hadn't just gotten started with a base set of knowledge. And I think sometimes what I see is entrepreneurs will trip themselves up by trying to find what they believe is perfect before you actually know what the definition of perfect is. Last one. Hi. Uh, how much genetics you are using and what kind? None. I mean, nothing. It's all non GMO. That was an easy one. All right. If we had another one, I'll... Um, this sounds really exciting from a consumer uh, perspective. Uh, I love tropical fruits, and I find it really hard to find <laughs> good quality tropical fruits in more temperate climatic zones. So yep. what, are you growing like passion fruit, bananas? I don't know what. So the one we get most frequently is can you grow avocados and can you grow almonds? But I, you know, what, what people sometimes are surprised by is you can actually grow absolutely anything hydroponically indoors. So we could grow a pineapple tree if we wanted to. It probably would not be a pineapple that you would want to buy. It would be slightly expensive, uh, but it would probably be hopefully a damn good pineapple. Um, so the truth of it is we there's probably a set of crops that I don't ever expect will grow. There's other crops that we're not sure about, and then there's a whole slew of crops that we're pretty confident that we're going to get to. Fruits, some fruits will work. Other fruits I think will be more difficult. We're growing a ton of leafy greens. We've grown over 100 some odd different varieties now. But we've actually grown things like radishes. We've grown things like onions. We've grown carrots. We don't talk a lot about it publicly, but our team is really excited about sort of trying and, and experimenting with different things. So there is a world of produce in front of us that actually is very accessible for the indoor farming world. And I think ultimately in the coming years, you're going to see move from outdoor farming to indoor farming. Great. Um, so I think we are about to switch from um, vertical farming to uh, horizontally prepared pizzas over there and drinks. Uh, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Really Absolutely. Thank, thank you guys so much.